Good evening, everyone. I'm Shauna Jackson from McBain Camera. I am happy to present our this evening's uh, uh, guests tonight. We have Chris and Russ from Nikon and our guest presenter, um, Nikon Ambassador. And here they are, Chris and Russ. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Hello. How, How are you, Shauna? Tonight? We're good. How are you? Not too bad. How's, how's things in your guys' part of the world? Good, you know, I mean, we're all facing <laughs> the, the challenges of COVID, but, you know, there's opportunities here too, right? This has given us uh, a chance to, to have a session like this, right? These are things that we weren't doing before uh, COVID, and, and we have a chance to engage a, a, a huge audience uh, in the comfort of their own home, maybe with a glass of wine. So, uh, you know, I, we're making the best of it. It's good. So, and uh, uh, we have sorry, our uh, we have our our guest uh, presenter here as well, don't we? Uh, yeah, we have Michelle. Um, so, uh, just by uh, way of introduction, uh, so I, I'm Russ Vanderleer. I'm the uh, senior account manager for Nikon Canada, and then we have Chris Oganek, who's our uh, uh, tech wizard. I think that's in his job title. Um, and uh, so we are happy uh, here on behalf of Nikon to uh, introduce uh, Michelle Valberg, who is one of Nikon Canada's uh, ambassadors uh, and uh, absolutely incredibly talented photographer, uh, maybe one of the nicest people you will ever meet. Uh, we have been having a lot of fun backstage tonight. Uh, she makes me forever jealous with the places that she gets to go to and the amazing uh, images that she uh, shoots. She's an amazing follow uh, on Instagram. Uh, and she'll have her details up uh, later. Uh, during COVID, she a lot of people don't realize this about Michelle, but she also shoots a lot of portrait too. She has a, a studio. She's been doing an awesome Planet Hope series during COVID to 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 show some humanity to this to these challenging times that we uh, are going through. And they're an amazing series of photos, but obviously some amazing wildlife photos, which is why we're here too. Uh, so we're going to turn it over to Michelle here right away. Um, I do want to say that. Uh, we are here because it's Wildlife Month at McBain, and that's sort of the, the inspiration to have uh, Michelle come in and, and talk to us. But it just also so happens I have to do this. It does line up with the Nikon Capture the Saving Sales event as well. So we do have some phenomenal sales. Michelle is here to talk about her imagery and her creative process, but she does talk about her gear too because it's the tool that helps her get there. Um, so we do have some awesome uh, deals. Uh, we have 500 bucks off Z5s. We've got 500 bucks off D850s. So lots of deals. And Chris and I are here uh, at the end to uh, answer Nikon questions if they come up. This isn't really what it, tonight is about, but if you have something pressing that you need to know, we are here to help you with that. Um, and for Michelle, she's going to be happy to answer your questions as well. Um, but she has asked that we kind of leave it to the end, just it keeps the flow going. So write them down, pop them in the chat, whatever. Don't forget about them. Uh, we do want to take your questions, but we'll kind of leave them to the to the to the end of the presentation. So uh, enough gabbing from Nishi from me. We have Michelle. She's awesome. So I'm going to turn it over to her. Oh, thank you so much, Russ and Shauna. Thanks uh, to you and McBain for having me tonight. And Chris, always uh, great to have you alongside for the the fun as well. Um, yeah, super super awesome that you're doing Wildlife Week. Uh, I love photographing in Alberta, and I uh, I can't wait to go back. Actually, I imagine that. Um, and I I forgot my glass of wine. I have water. Like, Chris, <laughs> can you imagine what's that? Anyway. <laughs> Um, yeah, so super happy to be here and thanks to uh, to Nikon as well. So uh, I have a presentation lined up for you that will hopefully inspire you and uh, ignite your creativity and, and I love conversations. So afterwards, I look forward to talking to more of you. And if you have anything you want to talk about, please uh, stay on and we will we'll discuss whatever it is that comes up. So Shauna, I'll... Uh, I'll you go, can you share my screen? I guess that's how I we're sure going. I sure can. To yeah, um, I'll, I'll let you take the, the reins and uh, we'll get started. Okay, great. We're all going to disappear on you, but uh, we will, uh, you'll certainly hear me. Um, all right, so here we go. Can you see me? And that all is fine, Shauna? Okay, I'm going to go with yes. <laughs> 
All right. So um, Russ did say that I, I am a portrait photographer as well. And um, this is my work from the studio in the last couple of months. Um, I have made a living at photography for over 30 years, which I'm really, really lucky to say and to be able to do what I love every day. It has been a struggle. It's been a, a ride for sure. There's nothing easy about being a photographer on a full-time basis, but I love what I do and I certainly have the passion for it. So portraiture is a big part and especially since COVID, uh, it has been a, a huge component to what I have been able to do while staying at home and not being able to travel. Um, I do do, if I'm just going to give you a quick synopsis of, of who I am, you can certainly find out more about, about me online and on my bio and my on my website and such, but um, I do some work for magazines. I'm the Canadian Geographic Photographer in Residence as well. I've had a number of magazine covers. I've produced four books. I, I have Look Beyond and Dare to Dream were way long ago, like 1996 and 2000. And then I have done a children's book on polar bears and that was in 2013 as well as Art of Kaleidoscope. So I have published a, a few books, and uh, when I'm not in the studio and, and creating portraiture, I am a resource photographer for a number of different companies, Adventure Canada, Frontiers North Adventures, and Abercrombie and & Kent. I also lead my own tours as well. I'm updating that as we go because, well, we just don't know, do we, when we're going to travel and be safe out there again. So um, I don't, uh, I have some hopes for coming out west to BC in October and then Antarctica in, in January and then the list goes on. It's been absolutely devastating to um, to lose out on, on so many amazing trips, but Anyway, I'm sure we'll all I'll get back to it and we will be happy again um, just exploring uh, this globe. But in the meantime, we can do our own backyards and you guys have a pretty awesome um, opportunity to photograph lots of wildlife out west. If you are from out west on, on the show tonight, I think we have a pretty amazing place here in Ontario as well. So I'm going to show you a lot of those images. But I do want to tell you just what's in my camera bag because everybody is asking. So I'm just going to lay it out and uh, talk about the amazing system that I get to work with. Again, you know, if you're a Nikon user, you can appreciate, um, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to be on this presentation because you're a Nikon user. It, you can be any camera user you want to be, of course, but I'm super happy to uh, be representing Nikon as an ambassador. I've used uh, that camera system, this camera system, uh, Nikon camera system since the very, very beginning when my dad gave me his camera when I was a teenager and he never got it back. So um, now I was part of the, well, two and a half years ago, almost three years ago, it's hard to believe, I was part of the Z7 launch. And I say Z7, I'll go back and forth between Z and Z just because it was, I was part of the US launch and I had to wrap my brain around saying Z. So it's now very hard to get that out of my brain, <laughs> but I do go back and forth. But um, let's say the Z7 is uh, in my camera bag. I always have three cameras. Um, uh, on hand. I have the 6.2 and the 7.2 as well. And I have to say, people ask me, what camera would you grab? And I first, and I would have to say the 7.2 is my camera of choice right now. I'm very happy to have the 6.2 in my bag as well for low light. Um, if I'm doing birds in flight, I might grab the 6.2 with a faster frame rate. But uh, right now I am reaching for the 7.2 most often. I do put in, of course, I don't carry all of this when I go away, but I try if I can. Um, I love to have a, a macro. I use a 60 millimeter. My portraits, I'm absolutely in love with the 105 1.4. I was using the 85 dedicated S lens um, for a while, and then I've gone back to the 104, and I'm absolutely loving it with the 7.2, and of course, using the FTZ adapter. The 500 millimeter is what I would reach for with the 7.2. Uh, that is my combo of choice. I do have the two times extender that I'll use on both the 500 and the, two, and the 800, but I'll also use the 1.2 on the 800 millimeter, the dedicated extender as well. When I'm traveling with the 800, obviously <laughs> I have to be dedicated. Um, it requires a tripod, it requires a gimbal head, 
requires a lot more manpower, a lot to help me carry everything. Um, but if I can, like right now, I'm uh, borrowing the 800 millimeter and I'm absolutely loving it for all the spring wildlife that I'm photographing. I try to go out every day. And the 85 is in my bag, 1424, the 2470 and the 70 to 200, the beautiful uh, trifecta of, of lenses uh, for the mirrorless system. So those are my, my go-to uh, um, kind of lenses, obviously not at the same time, but um, with the seven, uh, I would probably have on the 1424, 2470, um, you know, the 62, maybe with the 800, the 72. It really depends on what I'm photographing and what kind of day, where I am, and what's going on. So I, I change it up all the time. So that's a little snippet of what I like to shoot with and what I like to carry. So I'm just going to lay this out right at the front because I can go through and I can, I'm going to be talking about this throughout my whole presentation. But, you know, there's some key elements that we all know. Um, it's just a reminder probably for, for many of you, if not all of you. And it's a reminder for me too. And I'm continuously learning. But to set yourself up for success with your photography, you got to know your camera and really, really, really know your camera. And just because you're going to get a good camera off the bat, no matter what brand it is, doesn't mean that it's going to make you a better photographer. It's going to help your photography for sure, but you really have to dig deep and watch YouTube channels, watch Chris on, on Nikon TV and, and really get to know those little intricacies of, of the camera that you wouldn't necessarily know or find yourself or even in the manual if you have the time to ever go through the manual. So really, really know your camera. I can't say that enough. I still am exploring and learning different things um, about my camera all the time. Of course, knowing your ISO, your shutter, your aperture settings, and when to use what, how high you want your ISO to go, you know, when is appropriate to have, you know, the fastest shutter speed and, and when you want less depth of field, just really understand though that triangle and how your ISO shutter and your aperture working together. And get out of bed early. I mean, seriously, that's the hardest thing. So many people go, I cannot believe that you don't that you get out of bed at 4 30 in the morning or or four or sometimes 3 30 depends on where I'm going. I mean it's crazy if especially if you're a night hawk. If you're an early morning person then it's not a big deal. But man, these days are getting really long <laughs> when I'm up super, super early and I'm starting my day out in the field and then I do some portraits and then I come back and then I'm on my computer and if I'm not shooting, I'm on my computer. And if I'm not on my computer, I'm posting and if oh anyway, the list goes on. Then I have my family. So uh, my family does come first, I should say that. Anyway, um, understand composition and how it can improve your images and pay attention to your background and your foreground, especially your background. It's background, background, background. So, so critical. We'll talk about that tonight. Change and work your vantage point, your perspective. You know, get low to the ground. Um, change your vantage point, even by taking a foot to the a step to the right, to the left. Go up, go down. Um, you know, really looking at ways that you can create uh, using a different vantage point, creating that emotional impact. So you're going to draw your viewers in and make them spend time with your image and practice, practice, practice. I can say that over and over and over again. I am out all the time, every single day I photograph. I know that's not possible for many of you. And I think my husband thinks I'm I'm having a, maybe a, a little affair with my camera or something because I've gone all the time, especially right now when, um, you know, in my backyard, I don't have to go very far and, and I'm out there practicing all the time. Uh, continuing your education, uh, you know, I'm watching online tutorials all the time, uh, watching speakers. I love the Nikon ambassadors that are our friends and I love to watch them online. Um, really, really good. I watched John Marriott last week for all of you that were there last week as well. You know, so great. We learn all the time. And post-process your images. I mean, it just, it doesn't stop at you t pressing that shutter really know your your post processing um, get into whatever program it is that that you feel comfortable with and what remember whatever is right for you is the right thing for you but these are just tips that um, you know can help maybe improve and we'll be talking about them throughout the the, the program 
and getting out of your comfort zone. I talk about all the time. I was, I, I did a course a couple weeks ago and I was uh, a student for the first time in a long time. I'm usually on the other end and it was really cool to, to go out of that comfort zone and, and participate as, as a, as a student instead and really, um, really expand my horizons, if you want to say, um, you know, take chances and make mistakes and be patient. Uh, so those are just a few tips that I think are really critical in improving and can improve your images. And those are the reminders for me as well, that I need to uh, make sure that I'm, I'm doing all of these process, you know, all of these and more um, to continue improving my, my photography as well. So I'm just going to start with a little bit of a video. It's only a minute and a half long or so, um, just to show you a little bit about what it is like uh, on my end of the world as a wildlife photographer. All right, so uh, I love this author, Richard Love, and I wanted to start with this quote because I think it is pretty amazing. Both domestic and wild animals can have a profound impact on us. They help us every day, even when we are not aware or do not acknowledge that help. They expand our senses, teach us empathy, communicate with us in ways that science is only beginning to understand. I hasten to add that this isn't only about us or our kids recognizing how we share our habitat, not only the physical world, but in what I call the habitat of the heart is about the future children of all species. Isn't that amazing? Habitat of the heart. If you don't know Richard Love, I highly recommend uh, um, looking him up. 
he speaks a lot about children and nature deficit disorder and uh, he's just a wonderful author and and I just absolutely love that quote. So I wanted to start with you, start the presentation with that. All right, so I'm gonna show you a little bit of behind the scenes. Uh, I have been shooting, like I said, with the 800 millimeter quite a bit. I will, I've gotten myself into the Hoodman 512s cards. Uh, it's awesome with the 7.2 and the 6.2 having the extra SD slot as well, the second card slot that was not in the six or the seven. I'm happy to have that second, but I love as much uh, CFAST <laughs> Express card as I can get. I used to worry about having too much and wonder if something happened to the card and I would lose that much. But as you can tell, I do a lot of shooting a video and I like to go out and just know that I have enough space. And I know it, they're expensive. Um, and again, these are just recommendations. I'm sharing what I do. It doesn't mean what I do is the right thing, but it works for me. Uh, so I like to go out as much uh, with as much memory as I possibly can. I also shoot uh, through using a standard blind, but also I have this lens coat, full body blind. Uh, I've been photographing the fox with them. And uh, that helps me to stay my distance, to not spook the animals. And of course, that's hugely important that we're respectful to the animals and that we stay our distance and we don't intrude. We don't change their behavior or we don't interrupt their natural um, their natural habitat. So uh, staying at a distance, that's why I love shooting with the 800 millimeter. I'm not afraid to put the 1.2 or the two times on. I've been photographing the great horned owl's nest and it's a million miles away. So, um, you know, I use my, my car in my window and get all the lens that I can possibly get. I am a big fan of the think tank rain or the uh, hydrophobias, hydrophobias, uh, that's how you say it, um, you know, for the very, very wet, uh, crazy weather that I tend to be in with rain or snow. So they're awesome to keep a long day of shooting, keeping your cameras dry. One of the things that I thought about the mirrorless uh, with it being all electronic and, you know, smaller, I didn't really expect that they are as robust as the DSLRs. They have the same weather sealing and the, their, their, the battery life is is amazing. I, I remember writing Nikon right away with a, with a 7.2 saying, hey, I got 1,600 frames out of one battery. Um, you know, so they're resilient and uh, they perform extraordinarily well, even in cold climates as well. Uh, as I mentioned, I'll shoot from my window using a bean bag and I stuff my bean bag with buckwheat hulls. I find that they're much easier and they work wonderfully well and they're not just easy and, uh, you know, they work well, but they're super light compared to putting rice uh, or anything else into the bag. So that's my preference, but I will often shoot from my car window as well. Um, but my favorite place to photograph, I have to say, is in my kayak in the very, very early morning hours on my lake. We are uh, very fortunate to have a cottage on Charbot Lake uh, in Ontario, and you will find me any morning that is flat and calm and beautiful. You will find me in my kayak very early in the morning, and there's just nothing like it. Nobody else is crazy enough to be up at that time. You and the birds and the animals and the sounds and the silence, the peace, the tranquility, they're just nothing better. And when you're getting up that early in the morning and you're actually, I like to position myself and be ready for before the sun rises, um, you know, you can get some pretty spectacular scenery with your animals and that beautiful pink blue light and some fog or mist in the foreground, background. Um, you know, it's just a magical time. If you're a wildlife photographer, you know what I'm talking about. And chances are your wildlife photographer is here tonight. So, um, you know, it's just getting out there and, and being ready and being in position. So when you have encounters with animals and they're feeding and they're up early, um, you're, you're able to create these, these wonderful opportunities and images. So I have a pair of loons, sorry, we have a pair of loons on the lake. 
and they nest across from us or just down the way from us. They've changed their nesting area a couple of times. They're not always successful. And sadly, I um, I paddled around and found her on the nest, which I didn't expect. I don't um, approach at all. This was with the 500 and the two times extender. So often I will use that extender with my 500 millimeter and be pretty happy with the results. And it allows me to stay back a fair distance. It does uh, mean that I'm shooting at f11 and you have to certainly have enough light for it to make it worth your while. But I, um, I find the focusing and um, I just find everything works for me and it allows me more time with the animals as well. And one of the things that happens, in, and I had my first encounter with my loon um, pair this weekend, and as you can see, her head is a little, or his, I'm not entirely sure if it's a, a female or the male here, but um, one of the years she was, I think, hit by a propeller. So when they're carrying the babies, I always think it's the female. Um, and so she has this flatness on the top of her head. So I know it's the same pair that are coming back. And you know, it takes a little bit of time, but even when I got into my kayak and I was just hanging around her watching um, her fish this weekend, she was just fine. She started preening herself and then she, you know, she um, swam away when she was ready. And, and it's part of building the respect and the trust with these animals. And if you have the time, and I know we don't always have this time, but for me, this pair is really, really important. And, and enough that when they do, I do spend time with them before they they nest, and then um, and then after they come off the nest, they're this comfortable. I don't approach; they come to me. She actually even leaves her chick with me, or she did here as she went off and um, went hunting or fishing on her own. And it was like, wait a second, don't 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 no no don't leave me with your chick. Don't leave me with your chick. There's herons and eagles and big animals around so don't don't leave me but she does and um so i just talk with the chick and they become very familiar with me and i you know i think it's kind of uh it's it's well incredibly special but it takes time right and i've been on this lake for 20 years but it also allows me the time to to that they trust me to be in their presence and one of the things that I love about the kayak and especially with the mirrorless system is a I'm totally quiet and B with the kayak it's just it's it's I'm not intrude intrus, in, intrusive or you know I'm not disturbing them in any way and I stay a distance this was actually with the 200 to 500 um, but it shows the trust and their comfort level with me. And I'll tell you, I know in the day when they just, they swim off and it's like, okay, thank you. I always say thank you. And, um, but, you know, being able to be this intimate and, and low and, you know, creating that beautiful low vantage point. And I got a fishing kayak, uh, which is very, very stable. I can stand in it, which I, which I don't, but I'm able to carry my equipment very comfortably. And I'm, I'm very comfortable in the kayak and I never go out in really bad weather. I do go out in the rain like I, I was here. Um, but, and I have a dry bag and I have my emergency covers or my hydrophobia is on or whatever. Um, so I'm fully protected, but um, you know, it, it, it never ceases to amaze me that when I am shooting the mirrorless that I can hear the sounds. I can hear the sounds of the chicks and I can hear the sound of the rain and the, the calls in the background or, you know, just I can almost anticipate where the loon is going to, you know, emerge. And it's um, one of the biggest things when I when I got the mirrorless was being able to be one with nature and, and being able to absorb myself without having the sound of the shutter. Now, do I love the sound of the shutter? Absolutely. But, you know, when you're able to, to create uh, these kinds of images quietly, it makes all the difference. And the other aspect is actually shooting video through the viewfinder. When I picked up um, the mirrorless and I realized I could shoot video while looking through the viewfinder and the capability of shooting 4k and and all the um, functionality that I had at my grasp at, at just a flick of a switch it allowed me to do way more uh, filming which I absolutely love and this is all handheld and uh, early morning and coming in to feed this chick was only we think a day old um, maybe two at the very most and you're 
I'm shooting in slow mo here. So um, it's a little bit more forgiving. And I was shooting with the 500 millimeter and it just changes everything because you're able to show this kind of behavior in a presentation or to people, it just brings it to life so much more. Not that, you know, taking that picture and creating that, that stunning, beautiful shot uh, and stopping action is, is incredible. But the slow mo actually allows you to also see things that you don't or see things in the, in the, in the film that you didn't see with your own eyes. Um, so I'm always trying to create at least 15 second clips in, if I feel comfortable enough. And of course, when we're taking pictures of, we think, oh, this would be amazing video. And then if you're doing videos, you think you should be doing pictures, but, you know, staying committed, you can do, you can still fire off a frame um, with video. Uh, but I, I try not to do that too much and interrupt. I stay committed. So as much as those loons are so beautiful and, you know, so calming and we love the haunting sounds and I mean, they're just incredible to watch and be with. I was out one morning and this, uh, you could tell it was a little bit uh, higher light and, you know, by 9 30, 10, I'm usually well done after a number of hours. I go out with my coffee and uh, my back and my bladder will only allow me out for so long. But um, this morning I was like, okay, so I'm, I'm not seeing very much happening. And uh, I was starting to paddle back and then I saw these two loons bolt out of the water and then they went back down and I thought, oh, they're fishing. I'm not even going to bother. I'm going back. I'm going to have my breakfast and I'm not going to chase after those loons. And then they bolted up again out of the water. And then I just started firing. And this was with my, with my 500 with two, two times extender and they were having a territory fight, which I had no idea was going to happen in front of me and I just started shooting and um, you could see how violent um, they actually are and look at the beak wrapped around that loon's neck it was incredible and of course I wasn't seeing this I just knew that there was action happening but I didn't realize you know how violent and how um, how this uh, one loon had the beak around the other's neck and it all happened within about 30 seconds and then they were gone and then they chased each other down the bay and I at that point it was like okay so I'm not going to chase after them anymore I'm just going to go back and uh, and you know it was just incredible to to see and witness this and to actually capture it. I do, I am a manual shooter. I don't even use auto ISO unless, you know, I know that it is absolutely critical and I, I'm not gonna have a chance or I don't wanna miss a chance. Um, but typically I'm, I'm working all my ISO, my shutter and my aperture at the same time. I'll start with a preference of ISO and again, depends on the camera, how high I like to go, but I'll take all the ISO I can get in order to have a fast shutter speed. And then um, typically with loons, you know, if I'm at 5.6, uh, you can easily get one loon in focus and the other out or the, the chick slightly out. So I'm, I'm around F8 if I'm without an extender. I like to sh um, stop down a little bit to get a little bit more depth. And as you can see here, I was at the F11, which is the default uh, with the two times extender. And then ISO was uh, around 400, which uh, is, you can see the bright sun. And uh, I'm trying at least at a thousand of a second. The other thing is the in-camera stabilization, which is also, um, I, I think I started to talk about that earlier and then I, I missed out on it, but um, you know, the in-camera stabilization just makes all the difference in the world as far as the amount of shutter speed that you can get away with. Even with the moving subject, of course, that is where you know you're you're not going to sacrifice. But if you have a pretty stationary subject, you can get away with some pretty low shutter speeds. And uh, my raccoon, I, okay, I'm talking to you about my friends on the lake. So I also have this raccoon and she's used to seeing me and I know where she is typically in the morning and she's digging for crayfish and she'll look at me and I'll look at her and then she'll continue on her way. And she, she lets me stay pretty close to her and she just does her thing. And uh, even to the point that last year she had five babies and they, when I turned the corner and they saw me, they all scooted right underneath the dock. And I know she told them uh, to come out and she said, it's okay, it's okay. So they did, they came out, I saw it all. <laughs> oh my goodness, I must sound crazy, but I'm sure you all have a story like this. And uh, all the babies came out 
and uh, and they allowed me to follow along on my on my kayak, and I stayed a distance with the 500, and I just watched them learn how to dig for crayfish, and it was incredible to to watch and see that they trusted me, and then they went on their merry way, and I was like, yay, this is so cool, you know, it's not a raccoon in the city, I get to see them actually in their environment um, digging for crayfish. So I have a little video I want to share with you. It's just a short little piece. I'm I'm kind of dabbling into a few little pieces and just to give you a, an idea of what I'm talking about and how it how it sounds as well. So hopefully. This goes. So I actually hear her um, eating the crayfish before I see her. <laughs> Pretty cool. Um, and I have my friend, Harry. Yep. I saw him this weekend and uh, I'm telling you, he will fly over me in the morning and he will squawk and say, forget those loons, come look at me and I'm going to stand on the tree and I'm going to wave at you and I'm going to provide you way more fun opportunity with your camera than those loons. I'm telling you, that's what he was doing right here. <laughs> Again, my own story, right? Um, he even came and landed in the water. And I, when I went back and I told my husband that the um, the, loon, the heron landed in the water, he didn't believe me. And I'm like, look, and it was a foggy morning. And I think it was my dad coming over to say hello to me, to be honest. But um, yeah, and you know, typically with the other herons on the lake, you get within 50 feet and they, they fly off and they're going and then, you know, 50 feet further away from you or else they'll go across the island and then you go across the island to, to see if you can photograph them and then they're flying back over top of you. But this guy, he stays really, really close. He allows me to follow along the shoreline with him and he's a very proficient um, uh, fisher. You know, he'll go and he'll pick up frogs, he'll pick up um, uh, fish, obviously, he'll even grab a dragonfly off of a uh, leaf that's hanging over. And for me, this one was when he walked into this absolutely stunning light and background. And for me, I have the whole scene of him catching this fish, but I love the the eye and the placement of it. And I was thrilled when I when I saw it. So then this weekend, he came over on the Saturday night, and he was on our property. So I didn't even have to go very hard far and you know I didn't have to work hard I didn't have to go very far at all I just sat there and and I know he knew I was there and I just kind of talk a little bit and I'm like hey, hey, hey and then the next morning I went out and he flew over me and he landed and he allowed me to get nice and close and um, you know just follow along again this is with the 500 there's no two times extender on it it's almost full frame and uh, again he was he was walking into the beautiful backlight uh, he had beautiful backlight it wasn't a great shot for me but um and then the uh, the mist was rising and you know he'd just go along so i was thrilled to capture this on on sunday morning so that's my heron i have heron raccoon and a pair of loons that um i think are my friends <laughs> and then i found the green herons on the lake so my husband was really happy because he just retired and um and then now I was like, you know, uh, poking him at five o'clock in the morning going, hey, can you take me up? Because the heron, the green herons were further down and there was no way that I could get to them in my kayak. So he had to take me down to the fishing boat. But, you know, super cool. They were fine with us. They got used to us. And, uh, you know, it's not like we were that close to them, but um, there were four immatures and they were um, out and about and provided some pretty cool uh, opportunities as well. I can't wait for this year and to be waking up my husband again at five o'clock in the morning to go take me out. <laughs> we had such great weather last year. So um, I was out, I think, every morning. And uh, yeah, so we have eagles on the lake and and I've yet to get that shot. He was just coming in and uh, this was right off of my dock and I always have my camera down by the dock 
because if you don't, you know, you'll miss something. And uh, I have done that a couple of times. I can speak to experience on that. Um, but this guy, he just, he went down and, and I just fired and, and I take chances all the time. Even if I don't think that I'm going to be able to, to, to capture it, I try. And this is how it was cropped. And I was fine with that. I just love his talents. I love the positioning of his head and his wings and the feathers, the textures and everything. So you never know where you're, where you're going to, to land. This was another morning that when I was kayaking back, I was like, oh, okay, well, it wasn't great of a morning. Of course, we don't always um, have success and we spend probably more time waiting uh, for, for opportunities than we do have it um, time with it. Certainly with the fox these days, I've been spending hours and hours with uh, you know 30 seconds of activity. But uh, I was coming back and I looked up and there was on our property a white head at the top of the trees. And I was like, oh, this is great. It's an osprey. I had, first I thought it was the eagle and then I realized it was the osprey. And as soon as I got close, um, he took off. And I, so I was facing forward and he took off over top of me and then psh, the splash behind me. And I was like, oh, I missed it again. I haven't got the eagle or the osprey I want that shot of them going in the water and grabbing the fish. And uh, I was like, I can't believe it. All morning I've seen nothing. I have an osprey on my property. I come back, he flies over top of me and lands behind me. I couldn't turn around in time. But by the time I did get around, he was flying off. And I, I followed him and I just waited to see where he was going to go. And I thought, well, maybe if he lands on a tree not too far away, I'll puddle over. Well, um, if I can catch a sight of him uh eating his his lunch or his breakfast and he ended up circling around and coming back and landing on the tree where he just came from and a lower like right in front of me and these were also with the 500 the two times i know i was never a two times extender gal i was never even a 1.4 extender gal certainly i don't use them with my with my zoom that's just my preference but you know i was like this is just giving me way more opportunity and i've had great success with them so it allowed me to have nice tight crops. And the middle one is where he was, you know, um, shaking off his feathers after eating. And then he was gone. But it was a pretty cool situation to, to watch him and to be that close. And I did tons of video of this as well. And the majority, keep in mind, of all those videos are handheld. And when you think of even that opportunity before, it just never existed. It was so hard to shoot uh, with your DSLR, with, you know, a longer lens and looking at the back of the camera. I mean, it just wasn't intuitive uh, or you had to be fully committed to to doing video, whereas I can just switch off and and have both those components so easily. And if, if there's one thing, I, you know, if you haven't done video yet and you haven't explored that option, I would highly suggest it is so easy and it just makes our visual storytelling that much more compelling. Super excited that we had uh, Hood and This was a couple of weekends ago. Uh, again, with the 800 millimeter, it was just right off of my landing. It sounds like I live in paradise, doesn't it? <laughs> it doesn't always happen like this. There's days that you know you never see anything, but I was super, super impressed to see uh, this guy fish. He pulled up a crayfish that was the size of a lobster. I know he's a smaller merganser, but holy doodle, you should have seen how big that crayfish was. It took him quite some time to, to fire that down. That was crazy to, to watch. And then they took off and, um, you know, they're very skittish. And again, having the two times extender, being able to stay further back and, you know, they just started moving and I, I started firing. I didn't even know if, if I was, uh, you know, with the right exposure or, or focus or, or whatever. And we're going to talk about focus modes as well, but, um, you know, to, oftentimes I'm using the wide, small and and i know if you're a different camera system it, it changes but certainly um i'm shooting with continuous always i use my back button to focus and i change my focus modes depending on what i'm focused and what i'm focusing what i'm what i'm photographing and it really depends on the contrast it depends on how fast they're moving how large the species is how close you are what lens you're using and that was a real change for me as well from going from the dslr where a lot of times i was a manual focus shooter as well 
uh, to, you know, the mirrorless system where, you know, or when I started to do more autofocus with my DSLR, then it was, okay, so I use dynamic and I, I moved my focus point around and, and I was fine with using dynamic. And I, I don't think I ever really changed except for going to single point. But often when I was doing birds of flight, that was the, the, um, the mode that I would use. I find with mirrorless for me personally, I'm moving my focus um, points around and I'm using different focus modes almost always and changing them. So um, again, it's just really important to to know what you cap capabilities with the animal eye detect. It's incredible with people with 105. I shoot often with 1.4 and I my hit rate is 99.9%. .9%. It's unbelievable. With my dog, I again like I've I photograph using eye detect with my animals. I've been using it with the fox. It's been working really, really well. Um, with the new firmware upgrade as well. If you haven't done it for the for the new version that just came out on April 26th, I highly recommend uh, upgrading your firmware. I've also noticed lower light capabilities a bit better and also the eye detect for some reason or it was just because of the fox, but um, I did notice an improvement for sure. So these are crazy, crazy creatures on our lake. I swim in this lake too. Um, but again, I was I was just in the bay and then I heard something. I looked over and these two snapping turtles, I had never seen a snapping turtle on our lake before we're going at it. I don't know if they were mating or if they were fighting, but it was incredible. I do want to show you the video though that I did with it because honestly, it was a really tough situation to photograph them. I was able to stay longer with them because I wasn't disturbing them. I was in my kayak. I was far enough away. This was with the 500. I think I had the DX crop on uh, for the video. But you know, when you're when you're finding motion like that, it you know my it I it was just easier to shoot video, and I think it was much more compelling. And it was a hard. They they weren't coming out of the water um high enough anyway i i was really happy with this image but i never got the two the two heads but the the video component can be really really spectacular so again if you're not or if you haven't explored video um you know really try it and see what you can come up with because it can just be so incredible to be able to to document this hand holding i mean seriously it's crazy so nature is about smelling, hearing, tasting, seeing. It's it's about using all of our senses all the time. And that's really how we find wildlife by maybe seeing a, a spot of color, something moving. Um, typically we're not tasting anything in nature, but um, you know, hearing the sound of a bird, hearing water, whatever it is, and it's just keeping and being alert, using all of your senses. And I think a lot, when we're in the city and we're on the pavement. And that's one of the things when I found in the Arctic, and I've been to the Arctic numerous times now, like 60, but um, when you're up there, it's just so quiet and you have to exercise all of your senses. And, you know, when we're down here and we're in cars and cement and you hear traffic and, you know, we have the TV on and we have the kids play. I mean, it's just when you go out into nature, you can just absorb yourself and, and really exercise all those senses so you can get the most out of whatever is happening around you. Um, so I spent some time with Fox and, you know, it was a tough morning shooting. I was in my blind. I had the 800 on, the 1.2. I was shooting through trees and limbs and uh, the kids were very, very young. They were very awkward. Um, they were never in the same place at the same time. They were on the move all the time. And when mom came in, uh, she had some food. Uh, this one came right underneath her and then, you know, just butted himself up against. And, and I cropped it like this because of the trees. And I mean, her head was, was behind the tree. And, uh, but I knew, I knew I captured this moment. And again, this is when post-processing is so important that you're just not taking, I try to shoot for whatever 
a final product that I want in my frame. Like I, I'm, I'm all about that, but sometimes it's just not possible. And when you have all these interference, like branches and leaves and trees in front of you, sometimes just capturing that moment and bringing in tight and cropping in uh, can really make or break that image and, and provide you with something pretty special. Man, they're so cute. I just was photographing a uh, fox den just before tonight, and uh, they're just they're just so much fun to watch and their playfulness. And man, they're hard to shoot, right? But my uh, eye tracking was locking dead on to their to their eyes. They had a snake they were playing with. Uh, these weren't from tonight. These were from last year. Um, again, with my 800 with the two times, I'm at quite a bit of a distance. This was a fox den that we found just, you know, one of the things about COVID, right? And uh, we've been home and uh, perhaps maybe a little bit more suburban uh, wildlife is being seen. And we went for a walk and we're, this is right behind my house. And this was last year. And my husband said, there's fox and there's some kits. And I ran home as quick as I could to grab my camera, came back. And of course, they scooted away. But the next morning, I'll tell you, I was there at five o'clock in the morning, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to lose the chance to see um, this uh, fox kit family or a fox family with, with uh, five kids. So I went out every morning at five and at first she didn't like my car. She was watching me. And then, you know, by day three, she was fine. I, at first I had to change my seat and climb over my console to get onto the other side and then work the 800 millimeter by sitting there. I mean, it was just, it was ridiculous. Um, but if I got out, she would have, I would have changed her behavior and that's not what I wanted. Uh, so I was on the road, I was shooting over a fence and into this backyard and uh, yeah, she became comfortable with me. And when she came back and she would feed and look right at me, this was my, definitely my favorite from, uh, from that series. But, you know, you're starting at very early in the morning at, uh, you know, before sunrise. So my ISO in this uh, image was 4,000 and I was down to a, a 320th of a second and of course at f11 so super super happy with the with the results that i was getting and i just wanted to be really tight and in there and uh capture as much as i could of of the behavior and it actually worked well because i was so far away that i was able to anticipate and see some of the action that might have been happening and uh and unfolding before my eyes and, you know, again, just that beautiful early morning light, the rim lighting, I'm always breaking the rules with the with the light. Well, there are no rules really, but I love backlighting, side lighting. I'll take, uh, you know, we, we can't tell the fox where to go and where to be, uh, like the studio where I can tell my clients to stand. <laughs> I can put makeup on them, I can light them, I can tell them what to do. And it's that's the interesting thing going back and forth with, um, with uh with wildlife and portraits you know where you're in control to being completely out of control in their environment so here's a, a quick little video so one of the things um uh with the 800 and the two times then i'll use the dx crop with the video as well and uh so now i'm with the 32 uh, 16 16 32 100 um, anyway, it's a whole different ball game when you think of how far away I am and how close uh, crop this is. And again, just looking at the behavior and watching them and, you know, it's one thing to capture the still, but when you can start to, to show their little behavior and personalities and, and how they fight for their food and the hierarchy between them, the olders and the youngers or the, you know, the, the less, uh, I don't know, the uh, the size difference, whatever, where they all land in the hierarchy. Um, this is from this year, actually. And again, I would, I have borrowed the 800 millimeters. So I'm able to stay on the other side of the road at a safe distance. And um, I posted this for Mother's Day because it's just like, I love you that much. You know, I'm going to squish your face. <laughs> um, and they're beautiful, beautiful little eyes. And I don't know. I don't. I I don't own the 800 millimeter, and I I I'm an MPS member, so I'm able to borrow it. Um, it just gives a whole different dynamic 
look and feel to your to your images. And sometimes the crop is a little tight, but um, you know, I don't I don't really mind it at all, especially when you get really cool images like this. And these are suburban uh, fox, so you can tell by by the background. And it always trying to, I, what I spoke about earlier, I do a whole presentation on creating emotional impact. You know, I think we can all relate to, to this kind of image and whether it's our pets or reminds you of your, of your childhood or your, your, your sibling or your kid, or I don't know, it's just so beautiful and tender. Um, and then you have maybe not, not so much beautiful and tender, but certainly, you know, the circle of life and, um, yeah, that poor bunny. Um, but wow, I, I I think this is one of the best images that I've created this year, as far as as far as not the cutesy, beautiful, foxy photos, but certainly in the behavior department, it is um, it's definitely one of my highlights from from this spring for sure. So just telling a little bit of a story, and of course, you know, um, that's what it's all about. We're visual storytellers. We, we want to tell the story. And sometimes you can tell the story with multiple images and times the images maybe just be one. Um, this was in the Kutsuma team in, uh, in British Columbia two years ago. And we came across these mating bears and this beautiful female was lying on the, on the sand close to the shore. And, uh, and then she had this male that was, uh, beautiful as well. I mean, it was hard to believe that he didn't have any markings on his nose. Just a stunning species as well. Um, yeah, and he was, uh, he was uh, courting her and, and went over and, and he would sniff her. And then he would follow her. So she went to the water, he would go to the water. If she drank water, he would drink water. And then he would go over to her and smell her again. And then she would give him that look. And this is unfolding right in front of us. And it was incredible. And then, you know, being able to, again, see this happen before our eyes. But it was the courtship before, you know, and that whole lead up to, to this moment. And then to end the story is, uh, is the male. <laughs> I wish I could hear people laugh. I hope you're laughing because just I think it's so funny. Um, but you know, it's a it's a good multi-image story and uh, fun to end with this. And that's what ultimately you want to do, right? Is bring people people to uh, tears, to joy, to laughter. You know, you want to give them the opportunity to experience. And um, anyway, Russ is laughing. He said he just texted me, so thank you, Russ. <laughs> Um, you know, as, as you can tell, I love to get in tight with my, with my wildlife, but I also love to show the environment as well and, uh, you know, show where the animal is, give a flavor, and then you can go in a little bit tighter and then you can go in even tighter if you have the opportunity, you know? So again, that's like a three part series, you know, just showing a little bit more of, uh, of the environment to getting a little bit closer and then, and then really tight, which I absolutely love when you can get that texture and the eyes and that expression as well, which we're, you know, ultimately, always looking for and my moose and you know it's funny um I was eye to eye with this cow and she was very fine I was on the other side of the of the water from her and she had just it was in the fall and she's just lazily you know just walking along and then you know it was when she went down to the water to grab a, a little bit of water and then she looked up and and just that water dripping and the expression and and again it's the texture on the fur and that eye to eye contact which I'm I'm always looking for and hopeful for and if not it doesn't always have to be that they're eye to eye but when it is it certainly has a has a huge impact and like here where there were no eyes again it's just this it's an image that just makes me smile probably because it was rut season it wasn't smiling at the moment because we knew that this big bull was coming out of the bushes and we had no idea you know it was rut season and we were just like oh my god we heard him coming and then he appears and he stopped and he was just full on forest on his antlers and then it was just he was making sure we weren't another bull and then he turned around and went back so 
here obviously there's no eye to eye contact but it's just a fun really cool image to to have gotten and just to see i mean when he walked through you know we're all so scared and then this tree appeared so cool and this one, you know, when you you can put a, a maybe a family member or, you know, you want people to spend time with your images and and create content that that they won't thumb through your images like everybody else's, but they're going to stop. And there's a story. And uh, again, it's not just necessarily a, a series, but sometimes it could be one. And, and this one just cracks me up. And it was just waiting, anticipating, watching the behavior of the puffins and knowing they were going to take off and where they were going to take off and hopefully um, capture something pretty fun. So you can, you know, maybe put your family, you can know who the front one is that was jumping straight up and down. And, you know, the other ones that are waiting for the others to take off. I don't know. It's just, it's so much fun for me. I love this image. And this is when Russ tells me a really funny joke. And then we both have a good laughing fit. <laughs> oh, it's so funny talking to a screen and myself. <laughs> or how we feel about... Um, you know, being in whatever, 16 months of COVID, our our heads are underground and it's just like, what day is it again? Is it Groundhog Day? Maybe he's looking for a groundhog. Um, polar bears, as you'll notice, Chris, I'm not showing too many polar bears tonight. Um, you know, again, just the behavior, making somebody smile, maybe putting some sort of, you know, human, human element to it or, you know, that people could, just relate to this and say, oh, it's Monday again, um, you know, dragging my feet or, you know, this is the polar bear ceiling, they call it. And uh, again, just making somebody laugh with your, with your photos um, is a, is a real, is a real gift. I call it, okay, so this one is a, a snowshoe hair and uh, I was photographing birds in the snow with my buddies and then somebody said, oh, there's a snowshoe hair. So I started photographing this snowshoe hair and I had never seen a snowshoe hair before, but anyway, lo and behold, a number of years later, like eight years later, I got a call asking if I had any photos of snowshoe hair. And you never know, because this was photographed in my backyard. I can travel all over the world and photograph anywhere else and big animals and you know beautiful beasts, but a snowshoe hair ends up on a Canada Post stamp. So you never know where your images are going to appear and never think that photographing around home is not worth it wherever you might be. Um, it, there's lots and lots of opportunity and you never, you never know. And, and I just, I photograph almost everything now just, just to have documented. And also it's COVID and I'm at home and I'm exploring more and I'm seeing more and I'm putting on my macro and I'm looking for different things. I'm looking for insects. I'm looking for animals I haven't seen before and birds and migrating birds and uh, anything that I can. And people are, are telling me what what's out there too. So that kind of helps as well. And then the last component is light. I mean, that's ultimately, right, is what um, is going to make your images stand out. And I think as photographers, as storytellers, visual storytellers, as whatever kind of photography that you do, if you're just getting into wildlife or it's people, it's the same thing with people as well. It's it's all about the light and it's about how you use that light. And how are you gonna get your images to stand out more than somebody else's? Or how can you create differently than everybody else? And it, and ultimately it's going to come down at, at light and opportunity and getting out there and really working the light in your, in your, on, uh, in your favor. And, you know, looking through the electronic viewfinder now with the changing light, I mean, you can be, you can be changing your settings and you're on your camera, you're on your eyepiece way more. That's what I find anyway. And I'm reviewing, I can hundred percent, I can do so much in my viewfinder that I'm spending more time creating versus looking, you know, taking the photo and looking at the back or hoping that you've got this moment captured right, but also that the, the exposure is right and that you're bang on. And then you can also be way more creative with your with your exposure as well. And using that backlight, maybe you want to do more of a, a silhouette or you want it to work in a different way. Uh, and as the animals are moving through the light, everything's changing. Um, there's no predictability of where and what 
animal behavior is going to happen and with the, with the light. So you can set yourself up for the best success by anticipating and hoping. And then when something like this happens that you can use the light in your, you know, in your favor. Uh, when this one, I knew uh, that geese were coming in and I was initially almost straight on at the moment and I knew the geese were, were flying over and they had signets. I knew that they weren't going to appreciate that. So I thought, well, he could go after. So I, what I wanted to do was position myself. So I was using the light in my favor versus, you know, being straight on. And, uh, and it worked out, worked out nice. Again, I've taken thousands and thousands of these trumpeter swans and, you know, I don't have a whole lot to, to show, um, you know, but those few that you do uh, have success with are the ones that, um, you know, you can be most proud of and you can show. Same with the polar bears. Of course, I have to get polar bears in every once in a while. I usually do half my show on polar bears, um, you know, using shadows, um, using that beautiful, beautiful rim lighting and positioning, cropping, using side lighting, um, you know, beautiful low light, that golden hour that is so beautiful and can really highlight your your animal beautifully add more texture add more clarity to your to what your your image is trying to say and this was in Algonquin Park a couple of months ago and and we were photographing um, the barred owl and it was it, the light had gone down so the light had already had already gone behind the mountain and um, but this barred owl was just standing out so beautifully on this limb he wasn't moving. He was looking around every once in a while. And I thought, you know what, this is a perfect opportunity to test my, to test my camera. I had the 500 on and I decided, you know what, I'll go in a little tighter. This is full frame. Uh, I'll put on the two times extender. I'm going to up my ISO to 4,000. I'm going to handhold it and see how far I can go. And uh, I was able to handhold a thousand millimeters and one one sixtieth of a second. Like, I, I don't know, I, I've been shooting for over 30 years. I just never imagined saying those numbers together. Um, again, it's just taking the chances. I knew that I had a nice shot with the 500 at 5.6 and uh, I had the time. He wasn't moving. It was getting dark pretty quick. I had to move quickly, but, you know, I pushed it to see how far I could go in all directions. And I didn't really want to go up past 4,000. I wanted to see what I could do with my shutter. And uh, this was the result. Again, you know, the, the early morning, uh, this is the trees that I that I photographed through. So you can see it's not so easy. Um, you know, she magically appeared back for her kits in the right place at the right time. This is that magic hour. And uh, and I quite I quite like the feel of that image. Again, um, you know, pulling everything together, the backlighting, the rim lighting to the, um, you know, the emotion, um, the behavior, even the mom's paw. But, you know, that way that 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 cub is looking up at Ma is what really draws me to that image. Using I used uh, uh, the snowbank actually for foreground. I'm not a real big foreground person. And I was photographing the kids today with actually some foreground of the grass. Um, so she was, uh, this owl was on a fence post and I was on the other side of the road and I actually just pulled out my tilt screen. I wanted to capture some video. I wanted to get really low. So I was using my tilt screen and when I realized that I was, I was um, blurring out the uh, fence post with the snow bank. And I was like, oh, that is super cool. That just made the image and it was sunset. And uh, for me, I just love this. I was in that the fence was intru intru um, uh, interrupting or, or disturb. Oh, I, geez, it's late here and I've been up since five. Um, you know what I'm trying to say. You're not distracted by, by the fence post. Wow, was I trying that hard to find that word distracted? <laughs> it's a good thing I'm not drinking wine, eh, Chris? <laughs> Um, I'll go out in the snow. Uh, again, the trumpeter swans. I'll um, 
I'll go out in the snow anytime, even with the geese. Uh, I use focus peaking as well, um, which allows me a little bit more, I call it like a fusion between auto and manual. Uh, focus peaking I could probably talk about for, for half an hour, but it is in your menu system and I know it's in Canon, um, but certainly in the Nikon, it is in your uh, setup menu. And, uh, and it just allows you to fine tune your focus by using your focus ring. And uh, what the focus peaking does is it turns whatever's in focus red or to another color, white or green. And um, I think those are the three colors or it's blue. I use the red most often. And that also helps with my focusing as well. If you have the opportunity or, you know, sometimes it works with birds in flight as well. Uh, but again, I, I've, been shooting for so long. I've had a camera in hand for so long and I was a manual shooter, uh, even focusing. So this is intuitive and it kind of gives me that meld between taking a focus with the auto and then just fine tuning it with the manual. Again, just being on my camera, that's what works. That's what works best for me. And sometimes your camera is fighting with the, you know, massive snowflakes that are falling or the tree limbs. And if you're moving and you're trying to capture this really quickly because you know the scene's unfolding and it could happen to, to unfold very quickly, you know, that focus peaking just allows me to know that I'm focused on those eyes and that it's not going to override. And that's why I use back uh, button focusing as well, because I can take that reading and I know that I am um, locked on to the eyes. And uh, I'm by pressing my shutter, it's not going to, to go back out as well. Mist, um, fog, the fog rolled in. It actually just created a whole different feeling to the image that we had some pretty bright light that was um, on the on the bear walking on the shoreline. And when this fog rolled in, it was just it added a whole different a whole different flavor. Again, and you know the rain, the snow. Um, you know, it's not easy to go out uh, in those conditions, but if you can or you're out, stay out and see what you can create using, using um, you know, the, the, the rain or the snow. It, it can really make or, or break your image. And of course, I had to end with this um, beautiful spirit bear. And, uh, you know, it doesn't, uh, it was just a perfect scenario. And again, the story is long for this, but it was in the Great Bear Rainforest a couple of years ago. And it was just the perfect scenario of, of everything. And those water droplets being illuminated against that black, black dark uh, forest background, everything just came together. And ultimately, I think we're all in search of those images that really, define us as photographers and and or the, those are our defining images let's just say and they can really you know put yourself out there put your images in contests or or um you know if you are interested in going into magazines you put your proposals in and and get to know the editors and the photo editors and you know your images aren't going to do very much well they're on your computer and nobody's seeing them. So I'm all about sharing. I do a lot of post posting on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. I love to share my images. And uh, you know, that's what it's all about and getting yourself out there, getting yourself your your images known and seen by people so we can all appreciate and and take better, want to take better care of this planet. Somebody wrote this on my Instagram page. Her name's Carol. She's wonderful. Uh, she always has some nice things to say, but this was like Wow, that's exactly what I'm trying to say. I find your portraits of animals are vivid with a sense of inner aliveness. You provide a meeting of equals full of self-presence and wonder. Oh, I just, I, I wrote her right away and I said, thank you, thank you, thank you. And can I use that? Because that's exactly, exactly what my, what my idea is when I'm, when I'm shooting, when I'm photographing, when I'm creating and sharing with people. So I'm just going to end with uh, a, a video I did for Earth Day. It's a short clip again. Uh, I love to share my videos and some of the amazing opportunities that I have had. And then I will open it up and we will have a conversation, hopefully. And you'll stay with and if, hope you're still here. And thanks for staying along with me uh, through my journey and my stories. And uh, I'll end with this little video and then we'll start a conversation.
Study nature, love nature, stay close to nature. It will never fail you, Frank Lloyd Wright. And if you'd like to follow me, here are some of my uh, handles, Instagram, Michelle Valberg Photography. Uh, my website's michellevalberg.com. I do, like I said, have some trips that I'm hoping to run in the fall and next year. So if you're interested, uh, stay tuned there. And I talk about my Planet Hope series on my blog and all kinds of things there too. So, um, yeah, that's it. If you're still there. <laughs> We're still here. Oh, good. There we go. And there's, and there's 134 uh, viewers still here as well. So yep. uh, there's, there's definitely some people watching. Yep. Okay. Uh, stop. Great presentation. Thank you, right. Michelle. That's awesome. <laughs> It was really good. You had me laughing too at a few spots. <laughs> I know you couldn't hear us, but we were we were here laughing. We're laughing. Oh, good. Yeah. God, it's so weird. Ace eh? just talking to a screen. <laughs> yeah. Totally. <laughs> laughing at myself. <laughs> uh, we did. We did have a, a question for you come in, and if you have, if you're still with us and you have questions, now is your chance. It's not very often you get to opportunity to pick the brain of uh, one of Nikon's ambassadors uh, or Chris, because he's a genius when it comes to all the Nikon stuff. Um, but we do have one question here um, and it was about uh, uh, your, your focusing, Michelle. So uh, if you uh, have your camera on the dock, just in case, right? Hoping for that opportunity, what autofocus mode do you have it in? Like what, what where is it sitting in case that action happens? I uh, well as I'm composing so if things are happening on the right I'm always off center a little bit so it depends on where the animal is in the frame and what where the which way they're going so I'll, my focus point is always off the center just a little bit or below and above and then I'm on continuous 
always. And as I said, I use back button. And then most often I'm on the small wide option. This small, is that the, the focus mode, the small wide? Um, when I was shooting the, the fox through the trees or today through the, through the grass, I'm on a single point and I'm always focused on the eye if there's, if there's an option. So if, if I'm struggling with that, then, and then I'm always, uh, focus peaking is always engaged. So again, if, if it just, you know, if a branch just, or the, the grass just goes this way with the wind, it can, it can lock on, right? So uh, if the animal's moving, and that's what I love about the back button focus as well, is that you, you know, you can lock on focus and then take your, your thumb off. And then when you're pressing your shutter, you're not, you're not, if there's grass or any kind of interference, then you're not losing that focus. For sure. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a really big proponent of uh, of back button autofocus for for anybody who's shooting sports, action, wildlife, birding. Anytime you're dealing with moving subjects while at the same time in a split second, they could stand still. And then you could have, like you said, something kind of come in between where you don't want it to activate. When you want the best of both worlds, for me, back button autofocus is, uh, is spectacular. It, it, it does take some retraining of your brain um because there's a lot of people that the, the muscle memory of using your your yeah. finger to, to to activate the shutter once you get past that 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 muscle memory um i i feel it's really really worth it but um everybody kind of has their own way of shooting yeah, yeah i was you know with my buddy the other day and he's like no it doesn't work for me you know so some people some people it yep. works for but it's like going from DSLR to mirrorless, right? And changing your brain to seeing your exposure and then going back to DSLR. And then I only picked up my GA50 once after and I was shooting porpoises in South America or something. I'm like, oh, there's, and I'm shooting thinking I'm seeing the exposure. <laughs> It's like four spots under. I'm like, what? Like, it's amazing how how we can, we can really retrain our brains. but. Yeah. It's whatever works for you. It's the best. But if you haven't tried back button, and then you you have to you have to set it that your shutters you have to go into your menu system, right, and and activate make sure that you're deactivating your shutter uh, release yeah. from your finger, uh, the front finger. Yeah. If anybody's curious, um, I'll actually just quickly while we're. Hey, Russ, who you was going to, hey? Yep, no, totally. I saw as soon as I reached, so I reached down. And, yeah, you know, we have, a, we, have a, we have a perfect <laughs> comment from Danny here, too, because he says, wildlife photography and golf are the same. Having a bad day but one great shot makes you want to come back and lots of practice time. And, like, absolutely with back button autofocus or just focusing in general and just getting good at it. And the process, yeah. you have to get out. You have to shoot. You have to take risks. You're gonna you're gonna mess it up sometimes, but the more yeah. you go do it, the better you're gonna be when you have those opportunities. Okay, take it away, Chris. Show us show us how it's done. Uh, th this is it. This is all it is. I uh, was just keeping it here. Uh, ASIC. Now it, it changes a little bit, but as long as you're on AF activation, sometimes it's A5, sometimes it's A6, A7, A8. But you essentially just turn from shutter AF on to AF on only, and that's all you have to do. And you're now back button autofocusing. Awesome. Uh, Michelle, we have a street biologist, uh, and and a street biologist wants to know why do you prefer the A7 to or sorry the Z7 II more? Is it the the resolution, the megapixels? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, yeah, and the dynamic range. I don't know. I I uh, I love the six two as well. There's 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 no doubt, and there are definite mornings that. I needed the 6.2 and I needed to push my ISO a little bit higher. I wanted faster frame rate. So they both have their, their space, but yeah, if, if I'm, uh, if I'm, if I'm reaching for a camera, it's the 7.2. I just absolutely love it. And the, the clarity is the 45 megapixels is, or is it 45.5 or 45? 45.7. <laughs> but yeah. but you're you know and it obviously gives you a, a, you know some opportunity for additional crop right like you work with such yeah. long combinations all the time but I mean yeah. sometimes just it doesn't matter you still can't get quite close yeah. enough right so the more resolution you have to work with the more wiggle yeah. room you have if you have to crop afterwards exactly exactly like the great horn owls that are a million miles away yeah 
on private property. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we always have to make sure we're respecting respecting landowners for sure. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, th this is one. This is totally not a Nikon question at all. This is uh, about you and the technique that you do. Uh, Thomas says, "I love the kayak for shooting, um, but I'm scared of taking my camera. Uh, how do you store it when moving? Do you uh, use folding dry bags, a, a Pelican case? What do you do? Just have it in your lap?" No, because I have a fishing kayak, it's quite it's quite big. So I don't have one with pedals. So I have this shooting area. And I also took out the component that I guess held, you know, your lures and whatever stuff for fishing, which I don't sure. fish. So um, I have this whole front area that is right there. So I have a dry bag. Uh, I have a towel. And I do not put my cameras in there because I'll miss a shot if that is the case, if I'm fumbling. And also I don't want the animals to be spooked if I'm, if I'm moving too quickly or I have to pull it out of the bag. So um, yeah, I don't go out in, in bad weather. I totally get it. Like if I do think because people have asked me that. So I do think if something happened that I would cry and I would, especially during COVID and, and the lack of income, I would just, kind of kill me but um i i don't i don't ever feel that i'm ever putting myself at risk or my equipment in in my kayak and if and if you do then then you shouldn't do it for sure but that's a really long answer i'm 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 fine with it and i don't go out when it's like crazy windy right right yeah and I'm I'm in a bay, so it's, you got you got to see that as well. Like, and I I never go far from home either. Like, I don't have to go far. All everything that you've seen that I've shown you from my life is literally in a in a small bay. <laughs> so That's awesome. I love all your animal friends so close to your house, and just how you've created this relationship with them. And it's just amazing that you have all of that just like right out your back door at the cottage. There, it's phenomenal. Well, it's consistency right and it's going out all the time and it and and you've already said it russ it's like we're given these amazing tools i mean this is also what i'm carrying now like this is a 500 millimeter yeah. with you know and i can hand hold that so you know it's not like i'm picking up the 800 millimeter or you know even the old five or 600 in my kayak i mean this is just a it's a game changer for that so um yeah, and it and it's just because we have these tools, it doesn't. It's going to make us, you know, take better pictures. But we still have to be the creators, and we still have to know what we're doing. We have to know how these things work, and and uh, and fine tune our skills all the time, no matter yeah. what. I'm still, you know, it's it, that's what's so amazing, and I think also that it reminds me of golf because I really wanted to be a golf pro, not a photographer. But <laughs> you know. It, it's practice, practice, practice. You're out there all the time and you're consistently hitting, you know, you go out for a bucket of balls and you consistently hit one club and you take that whole big bucket of balls and you hit your driver, you know, uh, however many times. And, you know, sooner or later, you're going to get a good shot. <laughs> yeah, mean, hopefully. Right? Hopefully. Yeah. hopefully. Not if you're me. <laughs> <laughs> you, or you the slam shots and, oh my goodness, anyway. And, and you talked about like knowing your gear and that's so important, but I think it's also really important that you, you know, your subject, right. That you take the time that you, you know, you're not a biologist, but you're not ignorant of biology and of, of, of the subjects that you shoot. You take the time to, to get to know them as the individual, but you know, as the animal that they are, the species that they are too. So you can be prepared for the behavior and, and when to find them and things like that. Yeah, and the, the, that beautiful marry between um, art and science, right? And that yep. they're providing us an opportunity to learn about, you know, you might go out and photograph an animal or a, a bird that you haven't seen before. And then you want to learn about it, right? And Because yeah. people are going to ask you about it, so you've got to learn about it. And it just ignites that that level of you know, education that, that it just, that's what's so great about photography. It provides us these opportunities to, to learn. Absolutely. Well. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and we talked about how you like to, you know, you had the, the fortune to go out and shoot so much in your backyard. Um, but we actually have uh, 
Rankin Dad, who says he's watching from the Arctic. I don't know where. Um, and he wants to talk more. Uh, wants you to talk more about the ice bear trip. Uh, it's one on on uh, his bucket list. The ice bear up in well, the, high, well, uh, yeah. the high Yukon. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm, I, I'm gonna say right now that <laughs> Rankin Dad, you have you have opened the Pandora's box because Michelle could talk about this for weeks on end. We we guys, I'm sorry, we might be here till about four in the morning now. <laughs> But yeah, see it. I didn't put it in my presentation, <laughs> and I didn't put polar bears. Well, I did. I threw <laughs> a few. Polar bears. A I, had to, I had to throw them in, and a gorilla. Like I had to just kind of, you know, um, yeah. That that is just extraordinary. It's the only place in the world, and and quickly, it's the only place in the world that you can see these ice bears, and they're grizzly bears that. Uh, just before a hibernation, the there's a late salmon run. The water's warmer than the air that's minus 25. So when the water is hitting their fur, it it freezes, and uh, it you know it's my it's it's so cold. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I'm talking to somebody in the Arctic. Uh, <laughs> Uh, minus 25 is really cold, but um, you know, the, the difference in the temperature. So when they walk, um, you, they sound like a walking chandelier. You know, you can hear the tink, 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 wow. tink, the ice on their fur. It is, it's, it's unbelievable. And you're, you're on the ground. Like I've stared at an ice bear at like three feet away from me. It was crazy. That's amazing. Oh, there you go, Chris. That's my short. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I joke. I joke about it. I joke about how, uh, like, whoa, we always kind of go back and forth. But, oh, Chris, don't worry. I've changed the presentation. You don't have to sit through it again. But, like, you could have gone into and pulled up one of your one of your polar bear presentations from years ago that I've seen 20 times. And I would sit through every single slide because I love the stories. I love the photos. It's, it's yeah, I, hearing you talk about going up and shooting polar bears, it's one of my favorite things. <laughs> Next time. You're not, you'll be off completely. <laughs> and it's way more than 20 times. <laughs> yeah. We have uh, another question from uh, Danny who says, uh, do you use a gimbal head on a tripod often or uh, are you shooting by hand? Uh, he has a 800 Sigma and uh, he's getting tired to, to handhold it. Yeah, that's a big lens to handhold. Yes, I use a gimbal head. Um, I actually just ordered a fluid head uh, gimbal. Um, yeah, without a doubt, uh, it, for me, that that's what works great. Or you could use one of our PF lenses. They're so small and light too. They're not 800 mil, but <laughs> I with can't a, with a two times tally. It's at a thousand, yeah, so thousand. we're good. A thousand or even <laughs> one point four. You know, you're at seven fifty. <laughs> you're hand holding it. Yeah. Um, I got a, a question that's come into me from uh, Facebook from Heidi, um, and she wants to know uh, what kind of camera harness do you use? Um, and as a female, she wants something that's comfortable. Right. Um, I have used the cotton carrier harness, yep. um, and I also use the belt one as well. So. Uh, for women, I wanted to see the difference. I didn't have any problems here, but I could see it being, it could be an issue <laughs> uh, for women. Um, yeah, so the belt the belt can can work as well. For sure. Uh, and you know what, the, the people at McBain's might have some great suggestions about, about exactly. carriers too, because I know I know there are some out there um, that, that are, are designed specifically for women in terms of their yeah. fit. Right, and I, Cotton Carrier, I believe, have have ones yeah. that are... Yeah, and I think Black Rapid does as well too. Yeah. yeah. McBain's will have, have some great people to help out on that one yeah. too, Heidi. Uh, yeah. Barb wants to know, do you pack hand warmers and foot warmers for below zero shooting? Which is like... <laughs> Six months of the, of the year here in Edmonton, right? That's why she actually wants to know. I, I'm an Edmontonian people, so I'm saying that uh, I'm, I'm self-owning. So, are, are, you, are you expecting snow tomorrow, Russ? No, no. It was it was uh, it was 16 today, but I have been going out, as you know, doing a lot of nighttime aurora and stuff, and and it can get chilly. You gotta be prepared. Okay, so the foot warmers that I use are the ones that are the, the full the full foot. It's not just the toe warmers, so I don't know if you've seen those, but they're full no. foot warmers. 
they're way better than the toes because I find that, well, it, it keeps the whole foot warm versus just the toe. So the, yeah, the full foot, I don't know what they're called. Yeah, I, makes it clear. I didn't know those existed. I knew there was toe ones. I didn't know there was full, full yeah. feet. So Yeah, full feet. And Russ, uh, it's Alberta. It, we still get snow in May long weekend. <laughs> no, 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 we're not this year. It's not happening in China. I refuse to believe. So I hope it is. I hope it is. <laughs> tonight, it's, they said that it, we could have flurries at midnight here tonight. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, R R Richard wants to know, how much effort and attention do you put into wind direction? Oh, great question. Uh, when in the wilderness, do you use scent blocking of any kind? Um, and, and third question, uh, what, if any, bear repellent or defense do you use? <laughs> okay, so... You want the bears. That's <laughs> no, sense, no sense stuff. Uh, wind, well, you don't know if you have the option, you, you can, but often there isn't that option. It's where the animal is. Yeah. Um, but uh, the bears, as far as protection, I go, always go out with guides, and I think that that is a really great, um, a really great comment question uh, for sure, because it's hugely important. Obviously, that I'm not putting myself at risk or the animal at risk. Um, so for me, it's making sure that I'm always going out with a guide that has the protection to keep me protected and knows the animals. So whether certainly in the Arctic, if when I go out, it's never without a guide. Um, but certainly in the other bear situations that I'm in, I'm always out with somebody who who knows the bears far better than I do and, and has the protection to make sure that we're not uh, harming them or they're harming us, more importantly. Uh, yeah, yeah, and just another second set of eyes, I'm, I'm sure, too, right? Where, you know, if you're focused on your shot and you're looking through the viewfinder, having somebody that can give you some situational awareness is is probably pretty good when you're dealing with polar bears or something like that, so... Yeah, and positioning you. So you yeah. know, you're if you're shooting from the zodiac, I um, I travel a lot with ocean light, and you know, for example, anywhere anyone that I've traveled with, it it it's using them that uh, and they understand where as photographers you want to be best positioned for the light and for the interaction, but they can also more or less uh, tell you, you can use them as your ear as well, not just your eyes, but they might be able to guide you. Okay. He's going to, he's sniffing the tree. He's going to rub, you know, or he's walking over, he's walking to that tree. He looks like, you know, so there you have to be listening to them as well. Sure. That's yeah. That's cool. a really, really, really key thing when you're in a situation or, or with animals that you don't necessarily, maybe it might be the, the once in a lifetime trip that, uh, that 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 Rankin dad was uh, talking about before that you've never been sixty times like like you have Michelle. So if you haven't been somewhere a ton, you have mm -hmm. to listen to those around you. Whether it's the other photographers that maybe are on the trip that you kind of are are dealing with, kind of getting close with, or it's the guides mm -hmm. and the guides are. The, the amount of information they have about their animals is so key to, to helping you not only get your shot, but helping you keep safe as well. So they're they're kind of your best friend no matter where you are, whether it's up north, whether it's in Africa, you you pretty mm -hmm. much have to kind of trust them mm -hmm. to, to give you the best, uh, the, the best options all around. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I had one more question come in, uh, follow up from Heidi again on, on Facebook. Um, and uh, she wants to know, I know you touched on post-processing and that this part of your, your process. She's just wondering maybe kind of what types of editing you tend to do and um, what program that you rely on to do that. I am a Photoshop bridge person. I will use Lightroom for cataloging, um, but for for me, I my go-to is I bring most of my stuff into to bridge and then into Photoshop. Um, you know, having, I guess I, I refer to my Lightroom as what I used in the darkroom as far as the shadows, the highlights, the, the burning and the dodging, um, the contrast. Um, so I try to spend as minimal amount of time in most images. I have a process that I go through, um, but really any image that is coming up is 
is individual and and I process I never process anything exactly the same uh, uh, per image in a batch yes um, so I just I try to do the the very basics I love igniting to uh, bringing more attention to the the subject um, but try to keep it as as minimal as I as I can it's a good opportunity to maybe mention from the Nikon side too that we actually just released our NX Studio not that long ago, and uh, it's got some great cataloging and editing features, but it's free too, right? So you're just kind of dabbling into into it a bit, and you you know you don't want to commit to a uh, you know purchasing you know capture or subscribing to Photoshop or something. Um, that could be a great starting point or or a complement to your workflow in one of those programs. Exactly, yeah. and I yeah. Because last week, Chris, about a couple of issues that I was having that I couldn't access in Photoshop. And you're always directing me back. And, you know, it, it's <laughs> it's amazing, though, when you think that, I mean, this software is built for this camera system. I mean, it it's obviously going to be the best result for your for your images. And it'll allow you to do more than what you could probably do in the Photoshop world as well. Or, or as Rhett, Ross, what you said is just kind of pulling them, maybe pulling them together a little bit more. I yeah. mm -hmm. lost my, you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> uh, and, and and so so Bill Cook is actually asking, can NX Studio use plugins? I haven't actually tried to use any of the like Nick effects because I, I did used to use those. Um, I would have to try, but you can go and set it up so that you can within NX Studio go in, um, uh, do like the open with, and then have it linked to, let's say Photoshop, which is how I have mine set up. So I'll do most of my editing. Um, let's say I have a particular image, if I want the colors to look a particular way that I know that the that the Nikon software will, will get better rather than going into Lightroom, um, then I can go and edit it and then make my final edits in Photoshop if I wanna go and tweak something uh, that NX Studio can't do. So I believe it can to, to some degree, Bill, but I, I haven't actually tried it with uh, with some of the more popular plugins just because um, Very new stuff. I haven't, yeah, it's quite quite new and I haven't been able to, uh, to get my hands on it yet. Get my hands on them yet. <laughs> Good question though. Mm -hmm. yeah, it is. Well, I, I think that is all the questions that we have had and it is getting to be pretty late for Michelle. Um, She's in Ontario, so yeah. And she, and she's got an early start tomorrow to go find some foxes again. I think, so. <laughs> so, um, but I'd really like to to thank Michelle for her time and her amazing presentation, and definitely some laughs, and uh, for McBain's uh, for hosting uh, us tonight. Um, and just a reminder: support your local camera store because things like this don't happen. Uh, if you don't go out and support a great retailer like McBain's. So um, go in and, and shop with them and check out some of the accessories that Michelle talked about today. Um, go check out the Nikon Capture the Savings event that we have running right now with some really phenomenal uh, deals that are going on. Uh, great opportunity to, to pick up some of the gear that Michelle talked about tonight. So, um, And I'll, I guess I'll turn it over to Shauna because she's our actual host. She'll probably see us off. Well, thank you very much, Russ. I want to thank Nikon for uh, partnering us with this presentation. Michelle, for coming on. I really enjoyed it. Love the foxes. I was picturing these memes in my head as the photos were coming up. And uh, so, yeah, they were great. Uh, and I love the stories because, like you said, we all have stories. I have my own in my backyard. So, I very much appreciated and had a lot, a lot of fun. And so we're uh, very fortunate to have uh, Russ and Chris with us tonight. So again, gentlemen, thanks for taking time out of your day. Like Michelle, Chris is out east, so it's probably late for you as well. Um, <laughs> Chris is probably going to go chase the Aurora. And uh, so That'll thank you, tight. everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, and tune in, tune in next time for our next presentation. We look forward to seeing you all online. And come visit us either through our website or in the store. We look forward to seeing you guys all. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Good Russ. Thanks, Good night. Everyone.